Brother Tim's text is uh, from 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, verse 13. I'm going to read 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that in the verse 13 it says, to salvation through sanctification, completely necessary for all our salvation. Uh, let's pray for Brother Tim now. Dear Lord, I pray that you give uh, Brother Tim utterance, that you would help him to speak your word clearly, and please give all the listeners uh, grace that they would be able to focus on your word, and that we would all uh, take something from this sermon and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If while I'm speaking today it begins to rain very hard, I'm just going to take that as a sign from heaven that I need to preach louder. <laughs> so bear with me. We're going to look into the Word of God today. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And Brother Bob had a powerful message last night covering this verse, but he didn't cover all of it, and neither will I exhaust this verse. I want you to be aware of the richness of God's Word, that as you look into it, you will see more and more and more. It's like pouring out the crews of oil. The more you pour, the more there is. And just studying this for months, I feel like I'm just starting to see some outlines of what this is about. And it makes me rethink what studying is. Is studying really 10 minutes in the scripture? You've really got to devote yourself to the word of God and seek him and he will open up things to you. It's living and active, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. This is the word of God. So he said he has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Salvation is a big word. It's not talked about much today. But salvation is this whole process of preparing us to stand in God's presence. That's what salvation is. So that you can stand there confident and bold in God's presence in the last day. Salvation is this whole process. It's not just bowing your head and saying a prayer. It's God making you ready for salvation. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. That's salvation. It's the process of making us like Jesus, whom He did foreknow, them He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. While we live, salvation is an ongoing work. We're still being saved. Amen. Even uh, Paul said, it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer. It's, it's still out there. Salvation is still coming. But it is nearer, brethren. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Is bringing us to salvation. Salvation is the complete work. Jesus said, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So that's salvation, enduring to the end. Hebrews verse seven, or chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I want this uttermost kind of salvation. I don't want just an initial salvation. I want to the uttermost. And Jesus Christ himself is invested in getting you there. Amen. He is our great high priest. 
He is able to save to the uttermost. Sometimes we might wonder, am I going to make it? But Jesus is able. Get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes on Jesus. He is able to save to the uttermost. And so we now are still working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Still working it out. Salvation is this whole process of preparing us for heaven. Now it's not that justification is incomplete or somehow lacking. Justification completely remedied our sin guilt. All who believe are justified from all things from which we could not be justified by the law of Moses. In fact, we are complete in him. Complete. And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? No one can speak a word against you when you're justified by God. Justification is complete, but God has bigger plans for us than just taking away our guilt. There's more to salvation than just removing your guilt. And many people don't understand this. Many false doctrines just focus on this initial justification. But God has chosen to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Jesus, God is going to perfect us. See, that's, there's the goal. God's salvation means that you're perfect. Amen. He's going to save the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Justification addressed a part of us, but sanctification addresses the whole man. And this is part of what sanctification is. Just men still need to be made perfect. So, brethren, we're not there yet, but we're in the process. Are you in the process, brethren? Are you being made perfect? God's doing it. Paul said, not as though I'd already attained or were already made perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend. So we're in this apprehending stage, following after and apprehending that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. But I count not myself to have apprehended yet. And he, he, God has so thoroughly worked out salvation that he has provided everything we need. And he's given in the church some apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Here's the work that has to be done now. The saints have to be perfected. So God's salvation makes us ready for heaven. And God is the one who does the work. Do you know that God works in you by the comforter he put within you? This is how God is working in us. And one day, like Peter said, the God of all peace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. When God makes someone a believer, he's not just looking for a baby. He's not just looking for a sprout of a plant. He's looking for fruit, a completed person who is like Jesus and perfected. And that is the work of salvation or part of what sanctification is about. So salvation is about getting us from Egypt to Canaan. You can come out of Egypt, fine. But if you don't get into Canaan, what difference does it make? It's not enough to get out of Egypt if you don't get in the promised land. If your carcass falls in the wilderness, really, it would have been better for you not to have come out of Egypt than after having come out to turn from the holy commandment. Really, I mean, the wilderness, this is where we are, brethren. There's nothing here for us. 
If you're not going to make it to Canaan, it would have been better just to stay in the world. That's what Peter said. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn from the holy commandment. Be better to stay in Egypt than to come out and fall away. So our text here is talking about to and through. He has called you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Now there is an initial sanctification and there is an initial faith. But there is also a continuing sanctification and a continuing faith. Faith is initial. You know when they came out of Egypt... It said that, this is Exodus 14, 31, Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And it said, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. They came out of Egypt, we believe. But 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5 says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. They could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews 3.19. In Psalm 106, he says it like this. Psalm 106, verse 12. It says, They believed that, then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel. And then down in verse 24, it says, Yea, they despised the pleasant land, and they believed not his words. Verse 12 says they believed his words. Verse 24 says they believed not his words. Didn't Jesus talk about some who for a while believed? Luke Luke 8, 13, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. It's not enough to have initial faith. You have to have faith unto salvation. And we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. I hope that's true of you. It's like God said to Ephraim and Judah, your goodness is like a morning cloud. And as the early do, it goeth away. You don't want your faith to go away. You have to hold it firm to the end. And we are made holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Some people who haven't held on to faith, Paul told Timothy, concerning faith have made shipwrecked because they didn't hold the faith. So there is initial faith and then there's continuing faith. Initial faith is not enough. We must continue in the faith, brethren. And so we're chosen to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Actually, continuing in the faith is evidence of your election. Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. This is evidence that you're his disciple because you continue. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's that's how we're made partakers of Christ, if we hold it steadfast to the end. John said they went out from us, but they were not of us. Because if they were of us, they would not have gone out. So John also said, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So you want to know if you're one of the elect? Continue in the faith. Election is evidence of, or continuing is evidence of election. To the Thessalonians, he said, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. 
know, you know this. Because when you heard the word, the gospel didn't come in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. They knew something happened. That was a confirmation of their election. And what a great comfort to them to say, God has from the beginning chosen you. Yes, some are going to not receive a love of the truth, and God's going to send them strong delusion. But you, God, is from the beginning has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So believing in the truth must continue on to the end, faithful to the end. But sanctification is an ongoing process also. There is an initial sanctification. Jesus, we were, such were some of you, but you were washed. Ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. So it's, a, it's a done work in a sense. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Spirit does an initial sanctification, but there's an ongoing work as well. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, he said, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And that's an ongoing sanctification. He also said to the Thessalonians, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You got... Some that still needs to be sanctified. And Jesus gave himself to the church for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And so this is ongoing. And God chooses. It said that it is to salvation through sanctification of the spirit. God does not choose without trying. He says in Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. He's chosen through sanctification. In this furnace of affliction, through this process, God has chosen. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Now there's a similar phrase in 1 Peter 1, 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit. So it's the same phrase, sanctification of the Spirit. And he, he said it's through. The choice and the election is through sanctification of the Spirit and unto obedience. Here's how I, I see this working out, as Brother Bob mentioned last night also in Romans 8. How does the Spirit sanctify us? Romans 8 and verse 10, it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now that's justification. The body's dead. We are alive. We're made alive in Christ. We're justified. But then he said, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, now, if the Spirit of the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you, something's going to happen. So justification made the, the vessel a new vessel, and sanctification is putting that Spirit within it. If he dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. He's going to make this body alive and, and uh, wanting what God wants. This is the, what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's taking the rest of the man and turning him toward God. He shall quicken our mortal bodies. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's sanctification of the Spirit. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. Amen. So the point here is ye through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us by leading. By leading us. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The sons of God are identified by whom they're following. They're led of the Spirit of God. Jesus said when the Spirit comes, he will guide you, he'll lead you, guide you into all truth. And Jesus, remember, he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He leads us. I like where he leads, too. So Paul told the Galatians, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he said, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. The Spirit, this is how he sanctifies us. He leads us. He says, let's go this way. And the flesh says, oh, no, I don't want to go there. And we say, good, you can't come. Let's go. Let's go where the Spirit leads. The Spirit of God sanctifies the saints of God. He uses the Word of God and other sons of God. His appeal is through reason and not force. You see, that's what leading is. Come this way. Consider this. Look at Jesus. He is appealing to new creatures who are willing to be led. So this is the new covenant. It's, he's not dragging us. We have been made willing. His servants shall be willing in the day of his power. The new covenant made us love God and love his ways and want to go. So the Spirit of God provides the power to mortify the deeds of the body. But we have to do the mortifying. You have to do the mortifying. We have to follow. So the Spirit says, don't do that. You have to not do it. The Spirit says, do something. You have to do it. You have to follow the Spirit. But... Don't think for a minute that it was your strength or your power that did it. The Spirit is mortifying. The Spirit provides the power for you to overcome sin in every situation. This is not an anemic salvation. God provides for us to be overcomers. So when the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us, He's not just coming along for the ride. He comes to take ownership. He's, he's in charge. He's, he's not going to give his glory to another. God will not be mocked. So when he comes to dwell in us, we are sanctified. We're set apart for him and for his work. Remember in Israel, God said the firstborn, the, that... Um, Cometh the first that comes out of the womb, you're to sanctify it. He said, it is mine. Do you know I mean, that's the essence of sanctification. <laughs> it's God's. You're his now. And the Spirit of God is that seal, stamp, belongs to God. Amen. Now, the Spirit of God is the part of the Godhead that strives with man. My spirit shall not always strive with man. The spirit of God, all that God is doing with man. Jesus ascended up to the Father. He sent the Comforter. And God is dealing with man through his Holy Spirit. The interaction with man is by the spirit of God. Jesus said we will come to him, meaning that the Holy Spirit would come. But he, the Spirit of God is striving with us, striving with us to, to follow God. Don't give in to sin. Love righteousness. Hate iniquity. But brethren, I think there's a picture of sanctification with Israel in the wilderness. I'd like to share this with you. Now, the Holy Spirit was involved 
with Israel in the wilderness, said they rebelled and they vexed his Holy Spirit. This is Isaiah 63, 10. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. They remembered, then he remembered the days of old Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? And then verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. Did you know that? The Spirit of the Lord caused Israel to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Now it looked like it was all lost when... They, he brought them out of Egypt, and you've got this murmuring people complaining and fighting against God, resisting his Holy Spirit all along the way. But God is going to bring his people into the promised land. God is not going to be hindered. He promised to the fathers. Now listen to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. So I want you to think about that generation. And said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. But in verse 16, he said, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. How be it not all that came out of Egypt? Not all. Now, first you think, yeah, they provoked, but not all. Well, there was Joshua and Caleb, but there was someone else too. There was their children. The, those who did not believe, those are the ones who fell, those who sinned. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. Now in Numbers chapter 13, Moses sent out the spies, and they brought back the evil report, and the people grumbled and murmured and complained and did not believe God. And at this point, God made a distinction. In Numbers 14, verse 29, God said, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in. Amen. God's going to bring this generation in. He promised it. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. From this point, God made a distinction between the old generation and the new. He chose the new generation to go in. At this point, God decided they were going to go in. He chose them. You might say they were a chosen generation. They were going to go in. Now... The problem here is that they still had to live with this old generation. <laughs> oh, brethren. Our new man is going to the promised land. Our new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, it's going to make it. God promised it. I will bring them in. To their little ones, he's going to bring them in. But this chosen generation, now think, they were 19 years old and under. They're all here now. They have the promise, and now they're watching what's happening. After this, they watched, and they saw this older generation. They saw this man picked up sticks on the Sabbath day. And God said, stone him, so they stoned him. This younger generation, they saw Korah and his rebellion with Dathan and Abiram. They rebelled, and the earth opened up and swallowed them. With that rebellion, 250 princes were consumed by fire from the Lord. And they saw this. The next morning, the congregation murmured and said, You've killed the people of the Lord. They said this to Moses. 
And then a plague came and killed 14,700 of them. God sent a plague. This is God dealing with this old generation. And then the people said, behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Yeah, you do. But, but not all, because your little ones I'm going to bring in. Yes, you're going to die, you're going to perish, that's the point. But your little ones I'm going to bring in, so you're not all going to perish. Then he brought them to the waters of Meribah, and the people strove with the Lord and Moses. And he struck the rock twice. Moses said they provoked him. Then the people were discouraged because of the way and spake against God and against Moses. They said, our soul loatheth this light bread. You ever, your flesh ever said something like that? So the Lord sent fiery serpents among them. And much people of Israel died. But brethren, in this time, this is 40 years in the wilderness, then Balaam came. And he went out and he looked. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the people of Israel. But it, Balaam looked down and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. Now what Balaam saw there was two generations. There were two generations down there. But he said, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. They were God's chosen people. Now after that, Balaam did teach Balak to cast a stumbling block, and they committed adultery and fornication. Idolatry and fornication. This was at Baal Peor, and it said 24,000 people died in the plague. Now what I'm saying here is that this younger generation is watching all this stubborn, rebellious, Wicked generation that didn't believe God. And all this trouble that stirred up. But oh, you know, this man, he, he, during this time, this man took a Midianitish woman. And oh, Phineas stood up. You know who Phineas was? He was the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron. He was one of the younger generation. How do I know that? Because he was the priest in the promised land with, with Joshua. He was one of the younger generation, and Phineas stood up and went and stilled the plague. Now after the 40 years, Moses said to the people in Deuteronomy 4, 3, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord got... Thy God hath destroyed them from among you, but ye did cleave unto the Lord. I don't, we don't often think of good things about the people in the wilderness. But here he said, Ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. So there was a remnant. And there was a generation that God was going to bring in. Now initially... The congregation was dominated by the old men, but the younger men grew stronger, and the older men grew older and weaker. First, it's dominated by the flesh. But brethren, sanctification is going to change that because your old man's getting weaker and older and dying, and your new man is getting younger or getting stronger and he's renewed day by day. The Spirit of God is going to lead us in places where the flesh cannot come. Amen. So, like Jesus said to the Jews, he said, you're going to die in your sins, and where I'm going, you cannot come. Well, we can say this to the flesh. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Your carcass is going to fall in the wilderness, but I'm going in. There's a time of humiliation. You have to go to a time of humiliation. The flesh says, I would never go there. Well, good. I'm going anyway. 
Let's go. Let's follow the Spirit of God where He leads us. Maybe He has some exploits for you. And the flesh rises up. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid. We're not following you anymore. When the flesh starts murmuring, you just say, look, you are not in charge anymore. The only reason you're here is because I'm waiting for you to die. Really? Good riddance. We're not, we don't live after the flesh. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. You live after the flesh, you're part of that first generation. And you will die in the wilderness. God is changing who is in charge. Eventually, God told Moses to number the people from 20 years old and upward. But it says in Numbers 26, 64, But among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. At this point, they'd all died. And God had them number the people again just to show them that what he said came to pass. Not one of that generation was going to enter into the promised land. And brethren, there's going to come a day when you'll no longer have the flesh. When you pass over or when Jesus comes back, that old man's going to be left behind. Not going to be one vestige of the old man left when you enter into the promised land. They were now free from the unbelieving influence. Amen. This is really a remarkable generation. You know, and when Moses sent the 12 spies, they came back. You know who had the first say? The evil report. The flesh wants to have first say. You know, anything comes up, the flesh is right there. Let me give a report. We can't do this. Well, I say we ought to let Joshua and Caleb speak first. You know what Gideon did? Instead of sending 12 spies, he sent two. This time he sent two spies out. You know what they said? They came back after they spied the land. They said, truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. That was a good report. There was no murmuring. There was no, the walls, the cities shut up. They climbed down from Rahab's, you know, the wall of the city. They saw the walls. They saw all the people. They had a report of faith. Because God was going to bring them in. He said, your little ones, I will bring them in. The younger generation was a remarkable people. They did believe God. They did go in. They, Joshua, or Gideon told them, the ark of the Lord's going to come out. You follow it. Stay back a certain distance. No one went up and touched the ark. They all did what Gideon said. They went. The priest put their feet in the Jordan River and it split, it parted and they went through every one of them they did exactly as Gideon told them they obeyed then they went and they marched around the city, they obeyed perfectly what Gideon said I'm sorry Joshua, thank you I look at my wife and she's smiling she's no, no, no so uh, sorry so they, they did obey, and they went in, and the, the walls fell down. It was, it was the victory of faith, because they were a faithful generation. Now, the exception of that, I guess, would be Achan. But uh, I, I kind of figure he was like one who got in without a wedding garment on. <laughs> but uh, it was a remarkable generation, and it's a picture for us. That right now we're in this wilderness. Can you picture yourself in the wilderness? There's nothing here for us. It's wilderness. Our focus is on the promised land. We've got to get there. And now we've got this first generation giving us trouble. We've got to 
we got to hang around with the murmuring generation for a while. But God has promised he will bring you in. He will bring you in. So keep your eyes fixed on there. So we, God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth.